Welcome to the Startup Grind. I can, I always wonder whether I can live up to his intros. We'll try. What do you think? We're, we're going to try our best. Um, so uh, thanks for having us. Uh, this is fun. I usually uh, talk with Kevin on our, you know, walks around the park or board meetings <laughs> uh, or uh, on Twitter. Uh, yeah. So now we get, to, we get to do it in front of a bunch of other people. Um, as Derek mentioned, uh, we were lucky enough to uh, be the lead institutional investor in Kevin's seed round uh, less than two years ago, mm -hmm. uh, just back in September mm. uh, 2013. Uh, it was actually, you know, uh, sometimes when you meet a founder uh, and they're working on something, they're working on something really compelling and the rest of the world also knows it's going to be compelling. You know, there's an accelerated process to try to get to know them and move faster than the market's moving. Um, and I felt like we were aided by that, not just because, you know, we sort of we moved with conviction, but because I realized that earlier that year, you had emailed me out of the blue based upon a blog post before I even started Homebrew. And we shared that, that tea. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think I had coffee, but... A coffee. Yeah. Cana Canadian. You got that hard, <laughs> that hard edge. Um, so it was fun to sort of see, you know, that develop and, and turn into something. So, um, you know, even though you guys have, over the last two years, I think, you know, obviously grown considerably and, you know, raised funding and even more importantly, expanded to a lot of cities and delighted a lot of customers, um, I wanted to look backwards a little bit before yeah. we look forwards. Um, so uh, the Kevin I don't know is the Kevin that, you know, grew up in Toronto, maybe Kevin as, you know, more Vancouver. Uh, sorry, Vancouver. Kevin is more of a more of a kid, um, you know. Do you think do you think great great founders are are born or are they built? You know, did you did something happen while you were a kid that put you down this path? Were your parents entrepreneurs? Uh, no, they they were not. I don't know. I could definitely speak from my experience, and I would say that I've I've always done things myself. Whether it's it's small businesses that I've had growing up, um, or just side ventures, I've always kind of wanted to. Um, start something from scratch, mm -hmm. have a sense of ownership, and, and, and go through with it. Um, growing up, I, I grew up, uh, my background, engineering, uh, been a coder from, from early on. I had websites. Um, I started selling on eBay, which is a, a natural. How we're going we're gonna to go we'll, into that we'll one. Get, we'll <laughs> get into that. Um, I had a car importing business. I actually resold vehicles that uh, I bought in the States. Uh -huh. uh, the, there was a difference in the dollar and there was you, you could make a pretty good amount of money it was a lot of how many how many cars did you own at any what was your did you yeah, were you sort of young enough you had to buy one sell one buy one sell one or uh, did you have like 10 cars in a warehouse somewhere at my well it was my parents garage <laughs> and an outside of their home uh, I think at my peak I had like at, at most six vehicles probably at one time uh, I also started rebuilding them uh, uh -huh. I would find them that needed some work and I, and I would uh, be a little part-time mechanic on the side um, it was a hard business, mm -hmm. uh, not a very profitable business, but I always, I always wanted to do, start something from scratch, have a real sense of ownership, um, and, um, just learn a lot. That's, that's really what I did through all these businesses. None of them were really successful, made a little bit of money here and there. Um, but I think it, it allowed me to, to get where I am today. So the, the, the eBay power seller, sometimes companies, sometimes companies you maybe invent or embellish sort of founding stories mm -hmm. to, you know, Pez dispensers and, and eBay or sort of, you know, a dinner where Chad and Steve shared video led to YouTube. And like when you peel back the surface, maybe there was a little bit different. So you were really an eBay power seller. Really an eBay power seller. So and for that, uh, so the power seller term is after you get a certain amount of, I think it's radio, I can't even remember what it is, but it's like, it's, 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 you got to do some pretty serious volume to get was up this to that. While you were in school? And yeah. Like this is when I was in college um, studying computer science, um, and I just did this um, because I think I've, I think I've, I started doing it just because I I found uh, a line on uh, really cheaply made um, shirts that I was able to sell for a really high premium, uh, and then that just kind of led me down a direction of importing many many different items and and reselling it. Um, really tough business. Well, because you're essentially, I think w it was like the. It's so like the MMA shirts, right? It was yeah. like Affliction or yeah. whatever that yeah, like yeah. horrible bro brand was. 
horrible. I wore them. What do you mean? Uh, you know, you've got to rep your, <laughs> rep your inventory. So you'd get into a category, buy them cheap, <laughs> sell them expensive, and get out before the category got flooded? Yeah, but you'd usually, <laughs> what, what happened is that you'd probably get stuck with inventory. Uh, it's a global marketplace, so there, the competition is huge. Uh, you'd find, and I'd find this as well, I'd find other sellers that they had some sort of source and, and try to undercut them. That's what happened. So sometimes you, you couldn't even really resell the, the <laughs> supplies you had. Um, also came with packaging as well. Like you'd want to cut costs as much as you can. Um, and so you'd buy packaging in bulk. So right. like, hey, let's buy 2,000 of the, this size box um, for this particular product. Um, and then you just don't end up selling it. It's, it's a really tough And that was where sort of the first you know, maybe, you know, from an engineer's mindset, you'd always yeah. been interested in logistics or things, but in terms of really what turned into ship, was that the, the original, like, oh, I'm, I'm trying to be a small business here selling right. online. One of the frictions holding me back is packaging logistics. I don't want to be an expert in that, but there's no other way to, to build a business. Yeah, that, that, that led, like, the, the time difference was like 10 years. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like, and then I started right. uh, ship. Uh, but it really, it planted a seed with me. Uh, it was such a terrible process, and this is actually so. This is in Canada, um, and Canada Post is is probably worse than a lot of the the other types of services here. And this is a day prior to even printing labels online, so mm -hmm. actually handwriting the addresses on on packages. It was it was really terrible. Um, I learned uh, a lot about the industry, packaging, um, but also what what like our business model actually uh, depends on today is that. Even at a, a small scale, a small business, you're able to negotiate pretty decent rates right out of mm -hmm. the gate. Um, and that's how we actually uh, continued on um, uh, for our business model today. Um, but it really just gave me this inside look at this industry that hasn't really innovated at all. Um, and fast forward f 10 years when we started it, like a few things like you can now print labels out online, which is good, but still nowhere near where I think right. that the experience should be. Right. So you were clearly an entrepreneur before you were a Silicon Valley resident. Yes. Why, why, what and why come down here? Um, so I had a previous company um, in Vancouver. Uh, I raised a couple hundred thousand um, dollars for it. Uh, it was very, I don't know if you remember Milo. It was mm -hmm. basically what it did is it sourced uh, brick and mortar products into a mobile app and you could just search for, you're looking for this type of t-shirt. You could see the Macy's down the street has it. Um, the business model didn't work, uh, had to, to shut it down. But what I learned through that process is that, well, I, I'll, I'll really, like, I'm a huge risk taker. I'll really do whatever I can. And, and through that process, like, I made a couple trips down to uh, San Francisco um, looking to raise more money um, and just saw just the, the, the talent here from all an angles. Like, and um, from just the people that I met as entrepreneurs, the engineering talent, everybody comes here to build something really big. Um, and that's always what I've wanted to do as far as, like, uh, what looking forward, I want to look back on my life and, and be able to right. say that I've been a part of something big. Um, and that was really what it was all about. And, and just thinking, like, I think as an entrepreneur, like, everything is going against you. Like, you have so many things that could go wrong. Um, and it's really up to you to do everything in your power to, to, to get the luck on your side. And I think that moving here, it's like, if you could start a, a company anywhere in the world, where's the best place to start? It's absolutely here. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I decided after I shut down my, my last company is that I want to I come, come here, uh, network with people, um, and, and, and do it all again, but hopefully the luck is a little bit more so on you my didn't side. You came down here, but you didn't start ship right out of the gate. You were working at a another startup. Yes. Where, so when did this idea, something that could have just been a side project, wh you, know, you said you're a risk taker, what, what were you trying to get by working for somebody else first, and what made you decide now it's time to step away and, you know, try to build, you know, what today became ship? The the reason is just money. Honestly, uh, I was massively in debt um, from my previous company, um, and I just I didn't have a choice. Mm -hmm. um, I was doing some consulting work, so my uh, engineer iOS it's very lucrative. Um, I, I started consulting after I shut down the company in Vancouver. Um, but then I knew like, I could come here and get a job, um, really no problem. So it was really just to, to be able to, to get me to, to be able to start my next thing, but also like meet other entrepreneurs, um, um, network, kind of build, build all that. Um, but uh, I just need, and also my, my girlfriend now, luckily my wife was I, like, I was, we were both supporting each other and like there was right. no other 
way that we can make it work. So the day the day that you the day that you quit the Starship, what was what was the emotion like? All excitement, a little bit of nervousness. Um, I I wasn't really nervous. I was I was more nervous because we didn't have any money, and it was probably still the worst time to start mm -hmm. the company. Like moving out of San Francisco, uh, you need a lot of money to be able to make it work. And uh, when we actually started it. I was in a little bit better financial position, but nowhere near where I, I should have been. Um, and actually, when we, we did go full time, I was we we uh, me and my co-founder Josh uh, we moved into the same apartment and we actually Airbnb out our separate bedrooms just to make rent, which actually covered rent and food and everything. <laughs> um, we could have continued on for for quite a while if we wanted to. Um, so so uh, bunking with your co-founder and yeah. renting the other bedroom is the new bootstrapping. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Um, you know, you talked a little bit about coming down here and this being such a, you know, a nexus for folks thinking maybe the same way. You know, we've talked about this a lot. There's value in that, but there's also so much noise. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also a lot of information going around that's sort of not valuable. Now, I think, and you know, overall, it's great that the, uh, you know, what it, th starting a company, even just sort of tactically what that means is much more transparent than it was 10 years ago. Yep. You know, when you talk about networking, you talk about besides getting, you know, sort of back to zero from a bank account standpoint, w you know, what else were you sort of picking up or learning that maybe, you know, wasn't available to you outside of the Valley? Is there anything that you sort of think back two years ago and you're like, that's a relationship that's paid off. That, that was something uh, that I, you know, I, I learned from somebody else's mistake. I didn't have to make it myself. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, learn from, so I joined a company called Attachment Stop Me. Mm -hmm. Um, and now one of my best friends um, in, in SF um, was running it. Um, and, and a SHIP employee. Now, now he joined SHIP, which right. is awesome. Um, <laughs> and yeah, looking th like through that, that scope, like you're coming from Vancouver in a place that it's very unusual to raise many million dollar seed rounds. That just doesn't happen. Um, coming here and seeing that. But also I think getting just a taste of uh, the success and how big people think here. Of course, like you'll get the people that are very much focused on this the tiny thing that doesn't, like in my opinion, um, really move the needle. But there's a lot of like really big thinkers here, and they don't really see a lot of the obstacles. I would probably say that's one of the biggest takeaways, and that's mm -hmm. something that's always been I've been really passionate about. Like I really want like w w to be a part of something that just fundamentally changes something in industry, um, all those things. But of course, like I, I did uh, meet uh, other people that I still stay in contact with. Uh, I don't think from that experience any actual investors, but that was the hope initially right. anyways. So let's flip to that. So, you know, you start summer 2013 starting to talk to folks uh, from an investment standpoint. Yeah. And, um, you know, things obviously went quite well, raised a little bit over $2 million. Mm -hmm. uh, We participated. Tim Ferriss did uh, the first Angelus Syndicate, actually, yeah. Tim led. Um, and then a host of other sort of, you know, not notable people, David Marcus, who's, mm -hmm. you know, at the time was running PayPal now running yep. Facebook Messenger and stuff. So you're, you know, you, you were convincing, but, you know, during that process, you're also hearing a lot of no's. Mm -hmm. um, what was it like, you know, starting to hear no for some people? And what do you think they missed about what you and, and Josh and mm -hmm. the team were getting ready to build? Um, I think no's are hard. I don't know. I always, I'm an extremely positive person, so I always see past that. I'm always like, well, it's going to, like, it's going to, it, there's going to be s someone that's going to be able to, to write a check. But yeah, like, definitely, like, early on, it's, it's, I think for a seed round, it's, it's really like, there's a few different milestones. I think the first one is getting somebody to write your very first check. Mm -hmm. But before that, probably a lot of people, it very much is, is, and you probably know this very well, but her herd mentality as well. And everybody else wants to know who else is in the round. Um, uh, they don't really want to make the decision themselves, um, and uh, yeah, that that process uh, was was hard, but it was actually relatively quickly. I don't know. I think that um, I think venture venture capital. I think that wants to invest in these really big ideas, and that's what we really had from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, really seeing this this industry that hasn't changed at all, um, and while we we still are taking a very focused approach on it, um, it's a huge huge opportunity to, to change something um, and that hasn't been innovated in a, in a long, long time. So I think that we were pretty quickly able to um, get some yeses uh, that kind of snowballed mm -hmm. and, and then it turned into a, a very competitive round, which I think um, 
happen sometimes. Yeah. I was lucky to have that happen. Yeah. The, you know, you guys obviously sort of, uh, there are some things that pattern matched around you, right? Like you said, big idea, you know, two technical founders, mm -hmm. you know, uh, design and engineering. But, you know, some things that may not have pattern matched, right? Like, uh, guys didn't work at Facebook before, you didn't meet at Stanford. No. Whatever. Do you think the, do you think the industry and in both sort of funding and hiring overweights those those things too much? Is is pattern matching, you know, a liability in the valley? Yes, absolutely. I think from both. I think from a funding perspective, but also from a hiring perspective. Um, now we're we're hiring a, a ton of people, and like I didn't go to a Harvard, Stanford. Um, I really don't care where people go to school, and I think it's really about what they've learned. But a lot of other companies, it would, it would and I think like Google's kind of notorious for this have to match certain uh, parameters. Um, but I think the same, same goes to, to for the, the venture side. I think that people, they do. They want to pattern match. They want to de-risk their investment as much as they can. And, and thinking about somebody who's done something before or, or whatever, maybe de-risk is in their eyes. But I think it's a, there's a big opportunity to, to go after those people that, that don't fit that specific mold. So how do you, uh, from a hiring standpoint, yeah. how do you find those people or what what characteristics do you look for that you think you know other startups undervalue or you know don't don't realize you know are difference makers? Um, I think I get this question a lot of around like what our culture is, and I think that of course like it's the the usual sh suspects like super talented, uh, extremely smart, uh, really ambitious. Um, one that comes up a lot that doesn't a lot of other companies is humility, mm -hmm. which I think is is really awesome to 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 work with people that don't have an ego and. I've never worked at a place like that, and that's um, really awesome. And I, I don't think people put a lot of value in it, but it, it makes actually going to work enjoyable, um, and you're able to get a lot more so accomplished. There are there folks that you've talked to during the interview process who, you know, technically skilled or you know skills for the role are off the charts, but you know you or your team has sort of stepped back and said, I, I don't think they're a, I don't think they're a culture fit from that standpoint. They may not br bring some of that humility, the sort of you know hey, I want to I want to build something bigger than me type of mentality. And yeah. will, you, will you walk, you know, will you walk away from somebody because of that? All the time. Yeah. W and we do all the time and try to figure that early in the process so we don't waste anybody's time. But mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's really important um, for me and, and, uh, and the rest of the company as well. And I want to uh, like really and also from a, a technical and, and um, standpoint, like our bar is continually rising, which is really unbelievable to see as well. Right. Um, but yeah, I think you just there's certain things you just can't compromise on, and that's as far as uh, like we're not looking for people with the one to Stanford or Harvard, but that's definitely one that that we won't hire without. Got it. So you guys raise funding during the fundraising. You, uh, uh, Josh, uh, you hired your first director of operations. You hired you know you you basically started being ship couriers yourself. Mm. You know you're figuring yeah. this all out. Um, you know. You get San Francisco launched as a first city late winter, early really early spring, 2014. Yeah, March March 2014 March, we opened. March 2014. Um, what's that first week like? Uh, awesome to see that. For us, there was just so many moving parts, literally, um, for it to to work. Um, it was just really great to see people using it. But prior to actually launching, like we did a private beta. We wanted to make sure before we went and actually launched it that it would How did work. you know? I mean, there's always something else to fix, something else to improve when you're scaling a beta. You know, what what was the line where you said we're ready to we're ready to go live? Um, Anybody within a geographic area can now download this app and start using ship. Yeah, it was uh, for us uh, feature completeness. Um, user experience is something that we won't compromise on. And I think that that's the, I think that's the only reason that we're here. So making sure that uh, it was I think it's a much better experience now, but it was to a certain level back then. Um, and uh, just setting a date. But that even, that. I mean, feature complete, like, sounds good, but that, you know, if it's feature com complete, you know, there's a ton of improvements you've made since then. Yeah. Like, you made some decisions of, like, feature complete doesn't include connecting with an address book. Yep. Right? I mean, like, things that somebody might say, no, 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 that has to be in a V1. What were that internal discussions like about really where that line is drawn and what were some of the more contentious things that you know you pushed to either include or leave out mm. um i think it, it is a give and take and, and we do this today as far as like which features will go in like when you're looking at scoping a, a large project or initiative there's a lot of things that you wish would go into them even to this day i wish we could get everything in a specific release but 
you just you, you want to get it out by a certain time, uh, get people using it, testing it, improving it, um, and sometimes th that not everything, most of the time, not everything uh, will be included. Uh, yeah, some of the things that we didn't include early on, let me think back, uh, it was address book integration. And one of the reasons we didn't is because we found that nobody has addresses in, like <laughs> physical addresses in their actual uh, contact. Uh, list um, and so we decided we still actually don't have that today, but we'll have some <laughs> <laughs> shortly. <laughs> that's that, that's <laughs> the perpetual <laughs> point one release afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think a lot of a lot of the stuff um, for the service to work, we we had to have mm -hmm. um, one of the thing like we wanted to remove as many of the steps as possible and just make it super simple. So I think early on, and this is very similar to what it is today. Take a picture, enter an address, press pick up now, come to your home, pick up your items, and right all the packaging um, it is it's um, relatively similar to that it is today and I think that that's the that still is the minimum amount of information we need to, to make it happen uh, where you look at uh, what the other options are you need to have a lot of other different information including packaging and and, and all those different things that, that we just don't require right so off the strength of the San Francisco launch and you know proving a bunch of the hypotheses you had about where demand would come from and size of this market End up raising the A round, mm. summer 2014, yep. about 12 million, led by Sherpa that had been a small participant in the seed round. Yes. And aggressive about, you know, because they had an insider's perspective, they got increasingly excited. Launch Miami, New York, LA this year. Mm -hmm. So in four cities, Chicago coming up next. As you had to move from being the guy who was doing the iOS coding mm -hmm. to the guy, you know, playing a day-to-day, -day, still a day-to-day -day role in making sure everything's working, yep. to somebody who's now sitting, you know, with a management team, still small, but, you know, other people who own some of the day-to-day -day stuff and multiple cities. And how has your role changed and, you know, what's, what's been hardest about that change? Yeah, it's changed extremely dramatically. Uh, yeah, early days, I built uh, the entire back end, the entire front end. We actually had a, a web version that we were trying uh, initially, um, all the iOS stuff, um, and doing the fundraising and, and, and really everything. And, and now today, look, my role is completely different. I would say I, I, stil I still spend a, a lot of time on recruiting. I think that that's something, whether it's like closing candidates or networking with people for more senior hires or... Um, talking to search firms or, or whatever it is. I think that, that for me right now, that's, that's something that I can have a real impact down, down the road. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the other strategic things, um, actually managing uh, the executive team is something I spend a lot of time on, um, external and internal communications. Um, it's, it's really had change, but I, but I really enjoy it. It's, it's, it's completely different, um, and I'm, I'm glad I, I do enjoy this, this new role. Is there a, is there a peer group of... CEOs that you spend time with? Is there you know, a mentor or advisor that you've leaned in with besides high quality venture investors? Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, both actually. So um, not necessarily CEOs, but I surround myself with um, other entrepreneurs that have been in similar positions or are, are in similar positions. Grab dinner or, or whatever. Um, talk about the stuff you maybe can't talk about with everybody else. Um, the the real stuff that goes on behind the scenes, uh, and is and it is basically every rocket ship more screwed up on the inside than yes. it seems on the outside. Oh yeah, you talk to a lot of these people, it's like, oh, I, this is <laughs> I'm in a great spot. Um, and also on the advisor front, um, so this is something that I never thought that it, I would really value, um, but I I have uh, a coach. Um, she's really awesome and able to just talk about sometimes. I, she says is like a part-time therapist a lot of the time, <laughs> which is something like I've never, I've, I don't open up to anybody, but I, I think to have somebody to bounce something off that is not on your, uh, not within your company, has an outsider perspective. She has a, a lot of uh, both operational experience, but also she's a really great mentor and coach. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really helped me grow. Um, and I want it, I think that's, that's if you look at a, a lot of other successful people, and I, I try to look at them, don't model yourself after anybody else because you're not able to do that. But right. I think that the one common theme, if you talk to a lot of them, they, they just have this thirst of just continuing to learn. Um, and that's what I try to continue to do with, with every um, new stage in the business. And, and it's like even every couple months, it's a completely different stage. Just continuing leveling up and, and learning and, and questioning things um, and being humble about those, those, 
those things. Um, I think it's really helped me. What do you think, you know, if you talk about, I mean, I certainly get most excited about investing in founders who want to be CEOs of their companies for a very long period of time. What, you know, at what interval do you check and step back and say, you know, am I, am I the right person? Is that ever a question? You know, or do you have such, you know, sort of this long roadmap of things, you know, and you're just sort of shipping, shipping, shipping. It's not that, you know, sort of Literally. a question about, you know, hey, is this bigger than me? It, it definitely is a lot of just heads down execution, um, but also listening to a lot of people as well. And I think that if I, like, I if I wasn't able to uh, do a really good job, I'll be the first one to, be, to, to raise my hand and be like, this is not the, r the right role. But just getting a lot of, a lot of feedback from... Yeah the management team and everything to make sure that I'm still being a really good leader, I think is, is really important and um, re self reflecting and, and making sure that I'm still happy in this and absolutely am. And I'm excited to see where the next few year years go and maybe five or 10 years, who, who knows? Yeah. Um, I'm really still excited about that. So raise a B round earlier this year, mm -hmm. a few months back. So to answer the CEO question, John Doerr from Kleiner believes <laughs> that you should yes. be running this company for a long time and uh, raised a $50 million mm -hmm. round. Um, you didn't really run a funding process per se. No. Uh, there were a handful of folks, Kleiner included, who had sort of worked to build relationships with you and, um, you know, sort of, I, I call it, uh, you know, sort of were able to breach the gates mm -hmm. because I had a bunch of other later stage VCs who kept pushing me for intros that you wouldn't take. <laughs> um, how, did, how did John and those other firms breach the gates? <laughs> Um, well, it was a it was actually, and I think you know her her as well, uh, Megan Quinn. Mm -hmm. um, she's not at Kleiner anymore, but she was actually the one that that reached out. Um, I think she the were a little late for the A, but really um, interested and just continued to get updates. Um, really excited about the business. Um, brought John in quite a few times. Uh, he really liked it, and essentially like they preempted our B round. Um, of course, like we weren't going to take just a, a single offer. Um, so we did a, a mini process. I think there was like three or four different firms that we were talking with, but it was it was relatively quick and not something that, that we planned. Like, of course, we were planning on raising the next next funding round, but not not that soon. Mm -hmm. um, but it but it made a lot of sense. And and I definitely want to I, I look at uh, the capital as um, ammunition or gasoline for what you what you can do. And I I see this as a really, really big opportunity. Um, and I want to go as fast as we can, um, as long as um, we're making sure that we're still having an unbelievable experience and all those things. Um, and, and capital allows you to do that. Yeah. You're, in a, you're in a business, though, in a market where I feel like, and you know, you've sort of rejected the on-demand label for ship, you know, because you think the problem you're solving, some, for some people, will be on-demand, for others, might not. But it's, you know, it's not getting food from the restaurant type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but you're in a market where, for a long time, people were really focused on growth, 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 top line. Like people didn't actually maybe even look down, you know, the financial statements to yeah. understand if the growth was, you know, economically viable. It was like land grab, how many cities? Um, now with, you know, sort of $50 million in the bank, you know, how do you decide how fast to push on that pedal? Uh, you know, outside of whatever the stock market is doing yesterday, today, or tomorrow. It's up today. Oh, good. So we're, so we're, we're going to increase burn again? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know, as far, as far as me, like, I, I think that just focusing on top line is a mistake for any business. Um, and you look at, there was quite a few that actually went out of business for, for that same reason. And I think that what people typically do is they look for a certain pattern and try to replicate it. Um, I think in our, um, industry, um, it, comparables would be like the Ubers and Lyfts of the world. And, and Uber was re like really aggressive as far as expansion and in every single market launched faster than the last one. And everybody looked at as far as that as the, the playbook that they would go and launch their, their cities and, and looking at uh, just increasing that top, top line. But that to me never is the winning formula. I, I see this as a, f our business completely different. Like we have physical infrastructure. We're com we are a completely different business. Um, and um, taking our time, making sure we hit the right metrics whether that's like growth percentage in, in existing markets, uh, MPS score, um, the K factor, all, all those things. I think the, uh, th there's a number of different things, but to me that for our business is what, what made sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't think that you ever can just copy another playbook um, and apply it to your business. 
Uh, but we start to see people coming out of the woodworks and copying your playbook. It's interesting, <laughs> you know, I start to see websites popping up. I don't know who it gets up in the morning and decides they want to spend their next decade in the, yeah. the bowels of logistics unless right. they've been thinking about it. But success breeds copycats. Uh, you know, if you're not going to be in 50 cities by end of the year, don't you leave the market open to folks to deliver a fast follow or a ship-like experience, you know, in Europe, in Texas, in South America, wherever you're not launched yet? Yeah, I think that you just need to be focused on what you're doing. And I think that if you do get caught up in that, that's when you start making stupid mistakes um, and you do things that aren't the best for your business. Um, I very much think, like, like for us, that our competitive advantage is our experience. And it's extremely difficult to scale it. It's moving items around the world. Um, and yeah, it's like, don't get me wrong, when somebody completely rips off our website or something like that, it's, it's, it's a piss off. But I'm definitely here for the long game and see that. And um, I'm, I'm OK with, with that happening. Mm -hmm. we, of course, we try them and, and see that they're not the same experience. So it's, it's really, really difficult uh, to replicate. But, but focus on those things like, how do you, how do you build a, a natural growth rate into your product um, that you don't that you're stopping and knocking on doors or whatever that is? Like those are the type of things that, that we're focused on that will make us a, a really sustainable business uh, long term. Al also profitability and all those things that will just unlock us. And when we are ready, like we're going to be extremely aggressive. What are those? Uh, you know, so continuing to grow isn't just capital; it's about hiring. Yep. And you talked a little bit about the qualities you look for and how you know humility is going to remain consistent. You know, whether you are five people, fifty people, five hundred people, um, you're m doubling, maybe even more than doubling the size of the engine team this year. Mm -hmm. Pretty far along in doing that. Um, what are the engineering problems that are left? I mean, like you said, you have a city playbook. Isn't it just replicating that? <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, we have a very long product roadmap and we're, we're just at the beginning of it. Um, and there's lots of things that um, I, I, I like to think like the actual consumer experience for us, uh, the, the iPhone Android app is just really the tip of the iceberg and we have a lot of other technology under the scenes to, to make it happen. Um, whether it's to uh, decrease our costs on the transportation side or to increase our efficiency on the labor side, which is gonna get us profitability faster. There's just so many different problems um, in all different aspects of the business, and um, it's it's really fun. And also thinking about the different segments of, of the market that we could go after. Today it is consumer, but there it's it's a really a wide open market. Um, so that that will keep us busy for a long time. Strangest strangest thing somebody shipped. Strangest thing. Um, I have I have something, but I I. Strangest, strangest thing you're willing to share? Um, what are some strange things? Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, the, uh, somebody was testing their service, and they uh, actually shipped a, a, an eggshell. Um, that <laughs> just that. I think they, they tried it from all of our different locations. And the, the actual packaging and everything was amazing, and it didn't crack at all, which was a very weird test <laughs> to see. <laughs> you don't so they just like a, a an empty eggshell yeah. to see if you guys could ship it without breaking it. Yep. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so let's talk about the future in the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, earlier this week, uh, I think you were in response to a lot of Twitter pontification about where the markets are going and people getting obsessed about financing and sort of the financial engineering of companies and every company is a unicorn. I think you, uh, paraphrasing, you said, you know, you wish people would stop talking about, you know, sort of, the money and start focusing more on the innovation. Uh, you know, why? Why? Well, I don't know. I I I understand why the the press really goes down that road. It, it is one of the only measures that you could try to compare different companies. Every diff every company has something different. For Facebook, it's maybe the the daily active users they have, but for us, it's compl something completely different. So uh, I understand, but I think that it just gets everybody focused on the wrong things and that really bl like bleeds into everything. Employees, the people that we're trying to hire, and, and people just want to be a part of this, these unicorns, and um, it's really lost. And, and like when I, s when I first wanted to, to start in the technology industry, it was all about innovation, and it was, and that's the reason I got into it. It wasn't to create a unicorn or something like that. It was to, to change things, to, to take something that was broken 
um, and to completely rethink it and and hopefully change people's lives and all those things. And I just wish that that more focus was put on the actual innovation piece. Like there's a lot of amazing companies out there doing a lot of amazing stuff, and maybe they weren't valued a billion dollars, um, but the the companies that that um, are making that are are getting all of the limelight. I just think it's just bringing something that um, is not something that I signed up to be honestly. Um, and so you don't feel pressure yet, you know. Oh, you raised money a few months ago. You must be ready to think about that next step and what that valuation is, and whether it's you know investors who want to show that they're in a company with momentum, or employees who you're fighting you're fighting over talent for folks who are yeah. joining companies that are you know showing how much money they can raise you know how do you if the industry is in that zone right now how do you focus ship um i think th and this is actually something that we um will we'll ask people as far as like when when we start interviewing them um we like we're highly competitive and we could find out who, what other companies people are looking at um, but if if you're looking at going to um, another company that is uh, valued at billions of dollars, and that's what's really interesting. We'll tell you flat out, this is not the right opportunity. We're we're looking for people that are humble, of course, um, but really bought into this. So the anti vision. the anti cell, the anti cell, and it work. It actually <laughs> works really well. Um, and yeah, and I think just surrounding, like as far as what what we do to compete, I which is, is a highly competitive market out there, um, is 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 that it's it's the the long-term vision it's the team that we surrounded ourselves with like i look at myself like i what i want to i want to be part of like unbelievable um other entrepreneurs or engineer or whatever it is and and that's what we've tried to, to 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 create and then we show people that and they're really excited about that and they'll they'll come to us versus going to other opportunities Got it. i'll ask one or two more questions and then we'll we'll open up for some stuff from the from the audience um so interesting uh uh, is Uber a competitor, a partner, a non-entity? You share Sherpa and Kleiner, mm -hmm. both investors. Uh, Uber's running tests all the time. I think last week they started talking about like returns, pickups, or something like that in New York. Who knows what that means? Mm -hmm. um, you know, are they the thing in the sort of side of your eye? Um, I don't. I don't think so. I think that for us, uh, we're we're completely different uh because like you think about them like what, what, what are one of the phrases they're the urban logistics mm -hmm. or something like that uh moving items around a city and that's what they're really good at they have a lot of vehicles and they're able to 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 move people today um they've tried with items uh, but w with us we're building this worldwide logistics network and it's completely different it's extremely hard to replicate um and also it's it's really hard to make it work on the, the cost side of things it's this is not an industry that you could come in at a premium price and people would use it. Um, even early days, we were like, this is something that people may pay a little bit of premium for, but they're really not going to pay that much. Um, and as we think about going into different segments of the market, it's even more important that we get really get our costs down. And it's just really, really hard to make it work. And I think that that's like we're in an industry that has a few amounts of players, and, th and that's why. It's, it's just really, really difficult. Um, and I don't know if if I was them and I end up an IPO, I would stay focused um, and just look at their what half trillion dollar opportunity in front of them mm -hmm. and not get distracted. But I don't know. Um, so on the other side, you've got FedEx, great you know shipping partner. You mm. use FedEx, you use some of the other folks, you use you know local carriers. Yeah. Like there's lots of different ways that you guys get things from point to point. You know what? When do they become a competitor, or how do they view? you you aren't you removing them from the customer relationship yeah I, I think that um what we're doing is, is very similar to like a paypal or even even a square as well we're actually increasing the market and uh i think that um net net it's gonna be positive for them um because they are creating more volume right for the, they have fixed costs to fly planes and they need to fill up that plane exactly. that truck yeah, um, and we're able to do it for the, the different segments of users that they're not really designed for. Um, and the things that they really can't do, it's just not built into the DNA of the company. They're, they're really old, like you look at a FedEx, it was created in the 70s. Um, they were before the era of uh, the internet even, mobile. And to think about building a really amazing experience is, is really difficult for a company like that. And what we're able to do is, is build that experience and go to a completely different type of user that never even knew that they would have done this. Maybe, mm -hmm. I still think that if you think about selling online, this is 
or returning online. This is one of the, the biggest prohibitors for you. Um, and we're going to remove, remove that, that friction and allow things to happen. I look in a world like you look at an eBay um, early on, like before PayPal, and like I remember I had to send checks to people to, to buy things on there. And PayPal came, came along and removed one of the big fr friction points, um, and eBay ex exploded. And I think that on the shipping side of things, um, it's very, very similar. I sometimes think of ship as sort of like a reverse mullet. Your, your, you know, your party in the front, yeah. consumer sending back like the dress that didn't fit, but then when they walk into their business with their cell phone in their pocket, all of a sudden you're being used in an enterprise setting. Yeah. So, I mean, is the future, you know, you guys are ready sort of anecdotally, the Etsy seller, the Kickstarter project, mm -hmm. the Shopify store, you know, is that where volume and effort start to, to ship? Are you, uh, you know, high volume third party logistics service? Or do you think you'll always have that, you know, that consumer facing brand? Yeah, I think it'll, it definitely will always be a consumer facing brand, but a lot of those other things are really interesting to us um, on the actual, the, the back end, which is really the core product. It's this, this, this thing that could take these unpackaged items and send them anywhere in the world for very low cost. Um, and you could apply that to many different um, customers. And today the, the iPhone Android app is just a lens into that, that actual product. Um, but I think there's a lot of opportunities that, that open up, up for us. And I'd love to see us, like, let's, let's continue, let's drive the price down. Let's get so efficient that it's actually, it's a few dollars to send something across country or something like that. Um, I look like, like a company like Uber, like that's, that's what, people are not having vehicles now in cities because it's actually cheaper and it's more convenient than to, to have them. Um, and I, th I think that this is, uh, this is a huge industry that they have some similar parallels. So um, I, I teased you on Twitter that I, my first question of the day was gonna be, if you were an emoji, what emoji would you be? Yes. So instead of the first one, I'll make that the last question. <laughs> the, the package. The Come box? On. The box. Okay, that was with the rocket ship. Okay, so that's a, com a combo. <laughs> All right, good, good, good to know. I'll, I'll remember that.